morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you are listening. Thank you so much for making me a part of your day. My name is Lee Parm. You might know me as Lego Lee or Lego Lee 329 from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Patreon, you name it. I am all over the internet. And this is the Brickology Podcast, the study of small plastic bricks. How are you doing today? I sincerely hope you are doing well during this absolutely crazy time in our world. But I don't need to dilly dally on that anymore. I'm sure you all know what's happening in our universe, but more importantly for Brickology today, this is the 10th episode of Brickology. Yay! We have officially hit double-digit episodes of Brickology, and I am super stoked about that. I didn't think we'd get here originally. Like, I was kind of like, after the first few episodes, my streams weren't doing too hot, and I was like, man, is Brickology really worth it? But the past month and a half or so for this podcast has been absolutely fabulous. I am loving the results I'm getting. You guys are really seeming to enjoy this podcast, and I am really excited to be bringing you the first double-digit episode of Brickology and what I'm going to call the season finale for Brickology, sort of. Like, I'm going to make seasons, quote-unquote, of Brickology, and the first season will be ending today with my 10th episode. Now, don't worry. Unlike a TV show, when you have a season finale, you have to wait for the next season. The next season of Brickology is going to start next week. Don't worry. I'm not going to take a break or anything from Brickology. We're going to be pumping out these episodes once a week, baby, but this is kind of the official season finale for season one of Brickology, and I hope to make season two bigger and better than before. But one quick announcement about about the first episode for the next season. Next week's episode for Brickology will be a Q&A. So if you have a question about the show, just email me your question at legolee329 at gmail.com and make sure to have the title of the email, the subject matter of the email be like Brickology question and it might end up on next week's episode of Brickology. Since I have now had 10 episodes, I'd like to get something back to you guys and do a Q&A episode for next week's episode of Brickology. But this week's episode, we do have a theme in particular. Now, I mentioned on last week's episode, kind of an announcement I made last week, Brickology is now officially a pattern. It was kind of unofficially a pattern for the past few weeks, but officially now I want to alternate each episode of Brickology. So one week it will be an episode that's an unlicensed theme, and the next week it will be a licensed theme. So last week's episode of Brickology was about Lego Pirates of the Caribbean, which obviously, of course, is a licensed theme from Disney, which means this week's episode of Brickology, following that pattern, is an unlicensed theme. And I I actually had the help of you guys on my Instagram page. If you don't follow me on Instagram, just go to Instagram, look up Lego Lee 329. You can find me over there. I post daily Lego content. It's definitely worth a follow if you have not checked that out already. But on my Instagram, I asked you guys what unlicensed Lego theme you'd like to see. I did a little question thing, took all the submissions. I got lots of submissions. I'm very thankful for that. And the two themes that got the most submissions for that were Lego Atlantis and Lego Power Minders. So I pinned those two themes head to head and with 59% of the votes, you guys chose this week's episode of Brickology to be about blah, 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 Lego Atlantis. That is right. The 10th episode of Brickology as voted on by y'all is the history, you know, the hidden treasure, if you will, of the theme Lego Atlantis. So now let's jump into the history of Lego Atlantis. And, you know, per usual here for Brickology, before we talk about the history of the Lego theme, we have to kind of talk about the history of what the Lego theme is based upon. And Atlantis is a quote-unquote real thing. And the reason I'm throwing up those very serious air quotes is because obviously Atlantis is not real, but it's a staple of pop culture, media, and of course mythology. Atlantis originates from Greek mythology and it's this mythical city, this, you know, utopia-esque like city that has completely sunken underwater somewhere mysteriously in the Atlantic Ocean. And, you know, we see it all the time over different things in media. Of course, Disney released the film in the early 2000s about Atlantis. There's a whole subplot in Yu-Gi-Oh! about Atlantis. There are tons of examples, and of course, like DC superheroes, Aquaman is from Atlantis. Atlantis is very popular. And I think all of you guys just need to know, you know the basic gist of Atlantis is Atlantis the Lost City. It's a city that has completely sunken under 
water. And it only makes sense that because Atlantis is so popular in culture that eventually Lego would make something like it. And it's also very typical of Lego to make underwater exploration themes. Atlantis was by no means the first ever Lego underwater theme, and it's not even been the last. Now, I'm not going to focus too heavily on these other themes. This episode is just about Atlantis, but we have to kind of talk about the themes that help inspire and create Atlantis before us. Now, in the 90s, we had a couple of different underwater themes. We had Aqua Zone and we had Divers. Both of these themes came out in the mid to late 1990s. Very cool themes, introduced lots of, you know, underwater pieces and stuff that were used in Atlantis later down the road. Very nice, very cool themes, and I'm sure there'll be an episode about each of them later on in Brickology. Now, I think the more important theme to talk about, though, is the 2007 theme known as Aqua Raiders. I love this theme. I remember one Christmas, I think it was Christmas 2007, maybe 2006, when Aqua Raiders was, like, just coming out. I got every single Aqua Raiders set that Lego made. Like, seriously, I collected the entire theme one Christmas. I was obsessed with it. I think the Aqua Raiders, Aqua Raiders base set was the biggest set I'd ever built at the time. Great theme. And Aqua Raiders is not quite like Atlantis, but it could definitely be like a spiritual precursor to Atlantis because Aqua Raiders, they're hunting for treasure underwater and there are giant sea creatures that they are fighting. And that's something that Atlantis definitely took from Aqua Raiders. Now, Atlantis, you know, has a lot more story than Aqua Raiders, but it definitely seems to be inspired heavily off of it. And Atlantis came out just three short years after Aqua Raiders. Now, besides Atlantis, we have some more realistic underwater themes. Lego City continually likes to make an underwater sub-theme every few years. And apparently, according to some rumors online, that underwater sub-theme will be returning here this summer in 2020. But now we can start to talk about Lego Atlantis itself. It was introduced in January of 2010, and this time period means a lot to me. Why? It's because my YouTube channel had just started. I first made my YouTube channel in October of 2009. I was literally 12 years old at the time. I was still a kid. And, you know, obviously, if you're a big fan of Lego, you didn't grow up quite as fast <laughs> as some other kids. So Atlantis, a theme like Atlantis coming out at this age for me was super hyped. Like I was super hyped up for it. You know, we got the Lego teasers and Lego magazines and all this stuff. And this is when I was, you know, finally starting to get onto the internet and seeing Lego leaks and things of that sort. And I was super stoked for Lego Atlantis coming out at this time. I was the perfect age for this theme. And I have so much nostalgia, so many fond memories of Lego Atlantis coming out. And I reviewed a number of these Atlantis sets back in the day. Now, albeit I reviewed them extremely poorly. I was pretty awful at making videos. I was super young. I didn't know what I was doing. I have a video on my YouTube channel right now for my 10 year anniversary I uploaded back in October that kind of helps explain how bad I was at making these videos. But essentially, I was super hyped for Atlantis. I loved this theme when it came out and I have tons of nostalgia wrapped around this theme, which clearly a lot of you do as well because obviously you voted for this theme to be this week's topic for Brickology. So Atlantis is a theme that means a lot to me, and LEGO made three separate waves of Atlantis spanning over two years and 24 total sets. But before we talk about the sets based off Atlantis, we have to kind of mention the story behind the theme. Like a lot of unlicensed themes, Atlantis is very story driven. The characters had goofy specific names. There was kind of a MacGuffin or a, an assortment of MacGuffins that they have to search after and you can collect throughout buying all the sets. And this set kind of like Ninjago or Chima or Nexo Knights also had a Cartoon Network CGI animated tie-in. Now, instead of being a TV series, The Atlantis was actually a CGI film that came out on Cartoon Network. I definitely watched it back in the day. I don't have too many fun memories of the CGI film, and I have not seen it in at least 10 years. I can't really speak about it now, but it does exist. Now, this theme is about deep sea divers, shocker, that go underwater to find six keys that could open up the portal 
to Atlantis. Pretty simple story, and like I said, it's got a MacGuffin. If you don't know what a MacGuffin is, a MacGuffin in film is like a specific object that people are searching after. A perfect example would be the Infinity Stones in the Avengers movies. Those stones are like the basis for the story, and people are trying to get after the Infinity Stones. And basically, Atlantis does the same thing. There are these keys, they're all different colors, and when you collect all of the keys, you can open up the mystical portal to Atlantis. And the keys were very cool pieces. There, there's these interesting brand new circular pieces that had some transparent and gold kind of dual molded in with really nice printing on them as well. And each key had a different sea creature. So there was a crab key, a squid key, a shark key, a manta ray key, a turtle key, and then there is a special sixth key that came with the 2011 City of Atlantis set that we'll talk about towards the end of this episode. And speaking of 2011, one weird thing about 2011 is the story for Atlantis actually changed. In 2011, they actually already opened up the portal to Atlantis, and we'll talk about the portal set here in a minute. So after they actually get through the portal and go to the lost city of Atlantis, instead of looking for keys, they're now searching for golden armor for the king of Atlantis. So a different, you know, Chase MacGuffin kind of thing to collect throughout the sets in the 2011 wave. But we're going to start off here by talking about the original wave of Atlantis that came out in winter of 2010. So we're throwing it back to winter 2010, which I think is more so fall 2009. I think I originally got some of these Atlantis sets at Toys R Us like in November of 2009, back when Toys R Us used to release things extremely early. And... It was a pretty big wave of sets. It wasn't like a small six set wave. Lego really dedicated a lot to this wave of sets. And the first set, the smallest set from the wave that wasn't an impulse set or a poly bag was the Monster Crab Clash. This was a $7 set that had 68 pieces. It included one diver minifigure and a giant oversized crab build. The crab build in this set is kind of odd. If you don't know what it looks like, I'd suggest looking it up online. It has kind of cutesy eyes, which is weird because the rest of the creatures from Atlantis have kind of a scary look. But this crab in particular, I think is kind of cute, which I don't think is what Lego was going for with the giant crab, but it's a pretty cute little crab. But it's actually a fun little build and definitely a great small introductory set to the Atlantis line and of course it was the crab set and that means it came with the crab key now the keys in these sets are actually seen in multiple sets each of them appears in at least two sets if not three they're not hard to find it's not like some other MacGuffin items that only come in one set in particular and you have to buy every single set to get all of them Atlantis was not like that at all the keys are not particularly hard to find but this is one of the smallest sets to come with a key now speaking of small sets the next smallest set from this line that actually ironically had less pieces but cost three dollars more at ten dollars was the wreck raider this was like a small underwater scooter thing i don't really know the particular name for this kind of vehicle but you see this vehicle in lego diving sets all the time it's like a vehicle that has a couple of jets and you hold on to the back of it on some handlebars and it helps you move along under water. It's a pretty cool little build, and it's the first that gives us kind of a feel for this style of builds. These Atlantis builds, these submarines, underwater vehicle builds for these deep sea divers were very, very aggressively red. I mean, seriously, they are bright, bright red, and they have little accents of kind of lime green, and the cockpits are lime green, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. This is the smallest vehicle set from this initial wave. It came with two minifigures, a diver and a shark warrior. The shark warrior had a brand new rubbery head mold piece that looked fantastic. I remember I used this piece to make a custom Victor Crumb minifigure from Lego Harry Potter. Great piece. And speaking of new pieces, Atlantis was chock full of brand new pieces. We also had a brand new breathing apparatus piece for the divers, brand new sea creature pieces like the head molds already mentioned. And there were also brand new bubble shaped cockpits for the vehicles and brand new tridents that were the weapons for the sea creature warriors 
great slate of new pieces in these sets. And this Rec Raider set here included the Squid Key as well. Now, oddly enough, the next two sets in this line were actually the same price. It's not a price that LEGO makes too many sets of at this scale. They're both $15 sets. Now, I think these sets would easily be $20 to $25 in modern day LEGO, but the first $15 set is called Guardian of the Deep. It had 144 pieces, and this was a giant oversized shark. The shark had a very interesting color scheme. They had some kind of like weird hieroglyphic-like designs on stickers for them, and the shark was black and yellow with bright red eyes. The sea creatures in these sets, the consistent theme is that they do don't look like their real life counterparts. While the Aqua Raiders sea creatures definitely tried to make them look sort of realistic while being comically oversized, the sea creatures in Atlantis definitely have kind of an ancient and more mythological, mythological, mythological is definitely a word, mythological feel to them, but they still do look really cool and have some great designs. And this is a pretty cool Guardian of the Deep set. It came with one diver minifigure and Shocker, the giant shark set, came with the shark key. There were no other builds to this set, just the diver and the shark, but a great big shark build for an awesome $15 set. And speaking of $15 sets, we also got the Seabed Scavenger for $15. This set had 119 pieces, so not quite as good a deal, but I think an even better $15 set. It was an underwater buggy of sorts, you know, kind of like how space themes have moon buggies. This was a bottom of the ocean buggy, and this is the first set that we see that brand new bubble cockpit piece that is used on Jedi Starfighters and many other builds today. It was molded in, I believe, a new color at the time, which was a transparent green. It's not the typical lime green you used here from LEGO. It's a little bit more bright green. A really cool color. And this is actually a great build. It's small. It doesn't have too many pieces, but it's a big build. It has suspension. It uses those big, chonky, plastic power miners wheels which look really cool and it had two bionicle style arms one arm had a claw and the other one had a spinning saw blade which was also a power miners piece being reused in this set just a great looking awesome build it also included one diver minifigure and a manta ray warrior figure and the manta ray warrior figure was equipped with the manta ray shield not shield, the Manta Ray key piece. Sorry about that. So that was a really cool $15 set. But one of the sets I remember specifically being super hyped up about from this theme that came out was the $25 Typhoon Turbo Sub. First off, that's an awesome name. Typhoon Turbo Sub just really rolls off the tongue. This was a $25 set that had 195 pieces, and it was an extremely unique submarine design. It didn't look like any submarine we'd ever seen from LEGO in the past. It kind of looks like a space police vehicle or something. A super interesting build for this set. I loved the look of this build, and it had an amazing play feature. We're going to talk about great play features all throughout this Atlantis theme, but this set in particular had such a dope play feature. It had like a handle, so it was very easy to swoosh around, but if you pulled on the handle, the engines would actually completely flip 180 to reveal hidden cannons, and with those spring-loaded cannons that we don't see in too many LEGO sets these days, but the very powerful spring-loaded cannon pieces. This was a great play feature that worked super well and was really cool. It also included a diver and a shark warrior figure, and this one came with the sea turtle key. Great set that I have super fond memories of. Super cool looking set that I definitely wish I hadn't destroyed. I might go on eBay and see if I can get it for cheap because this was a super cool set back in the day. After all these vehicles and oversized sea creatures, we're finally going to talk about our first play set from the LEGO Atlantis theme. And LEGO Atlantis, while it's probably more known for the aforementioned giant sea creatures and vehicles, the play sets from this theme were dope seriously just some awesome play sets the first play set from the theme is the 40 dollars set titled gateway of the squid awesome name the set had 354 pieces and it's an amazing set seriously such a cool set it included the shark key but it also included this another new piece that was hooked up to some gears and this piece was like a rock piece that was specifically designed to be a keyhole for these keys so you could put the key 
into the keyhole and twist it and it would open up the gateway to reveal the little layer with some hidden treasure, a trap door, and of course, a giant squid build. This was a super cool set. You kind of mount the giant squid on top of the playset, so it is also a pretty effective display set as well. It even came with a smaller albino baby squid build on the side and a squid warrior, which is one of my favorite minifigures from the Atlantis theme because this squid warrior not only had an awesome headpiece, but a really cool bottom kind of leg piece as well with tentacles. Amazing figure and also included two divers. This was a great $40 play set. Now, kind of rounding off the main sets from this initial wave, there's a few more sets we'll talk about, but kind of the main sets of, the official, of this official wave, the biggest set from the first wave of Atlantis, the $60 set is titled the Neptune Carrier. Kind of interesting, it's called Neptune so instead of Poseidon, so we're referencing Roman mythology instead of Greek mythology, but that's kind of besides the point. This set was 60 bucks, had 476 pieces, and it's actually the biggest submarine from the Atlantis theme, and it was a really cool design. Very, very sleek design. It used the Jedi Interceptor cockpit piece in that aforementioned transparent bright green color. Looked super cool, and this was one of those kind of patented Lego sets that had a lot of different vehicles in one, similar to something like Mars Mission. This set could land and it actually had a little docking port for a small underwater buggy and there was a small little scooter that could attach detach from the back of this thing i mean seriously great play features all around a great looking sub it came with a manta warrior plus the manta key and a very small manta ray build i think the manta ray build was kind of a missed opportunity it's the smallest of any of these sea creatures seen throughout these sets which is odd because manta rays are actually really large creatures in real life and this one was actually scaled pretty decently to many figures with maybe even being a little smaller than it should be you know based off its real life animal counterpart all Although the Manta Ray did have a pretty creative use of parts, it actually used that kind of like car engine piece that's normally seen in silver. They had that piece in black to make the iconic Manta Ray head shape. That was a pretty creative use of parts. Besides that though, I think this Manta Ray build was kind of a missed opportunity of sorts. It definitely could have been better, but I do think the Neptune Carrier is a very cool submarine set that I really loved playing with when I was younger. Now, there are a few more sets from this first wave of Atlantis sets. We had a couple of impulse sets. The Sea Jet set, which is very similar to things like the Wreck Raider and the vehicle that detaches from the back of the Neptune Carrier, a little glider scooter, underwater scooter type build, was $4. It had a small arm in the front that could pick up a diamond. Very simple. Then we also had the $4 Manta Ward your impulse set that I think might be like one of the worst Lego sets ever made. I'm being completely serious. Not because it's terribly designed, it's because it's hardly even a set. It comes with the Manta Warrior minifigure, and then it came with a rock. I think this set had like 13 pieces. The rock was like seven parts. It had a new seaweed piece that has seen throughout this theme, which is a cool part to get, but it was literally a rock. There was nothing else in this set. A 13 piece tiny set that came with one minifigure and a rock. It might as well have just been a set that had the minifigure because that was the only interesting thing in this set, even though that minifigure came in some other fairly cheap sets. Pretty underwhelming sets, pretty stupid set, one of the worst sets I think LEGO has ever made. I'm not sure why they even bothered making this set. Absolutely awful set, even though it's just a small $4 impulse set, I still think it was a terrible set and a horribly conceived product by LEGO's design team for this theme. And finally, for the first wave of Atlantis, we had the special edition set that was either a Target or Toys R Us, maybe Walmart exclusive. It was a special edition store exclusive set that was the Shadow Snapper. This set was $30, had 246 pieces, and it's a giant turtle. And the turtle here is kind of odd because it's called Shadow Snapper, and it definitely resembles a snapping turtle, which snapping turtles are cool and very threatening, but the key it comes with is the sea turtle key, which is clearly based off, you know, sea turtles, which are turtles that live in the sea. Snapping turtles are not sea creatures. They live in lakes and ponds and things like that. They are freshwater animals, so I'm not really sure why Lego decided to make this a giant snapping turtle instead of being a giant sea turtle. 
of sorts. I'm guessing the design team was like, snapping turtles are way more threatening than, you know, sea turtles, which are beloved and cute. You know, obviously save the turtles, don't throw your trash, you know, recycle all this stuff <laughs> away. But I still think it's very odd that they decide to make this a snapping turtle, which is not an actual ocean creature. So this design in itself kind of sticks out like a sore thumb in terms of its accuracy to like, you know, wildlife. Although I think it's a very cool design. It had some really nice use of bionicle pieces to make up its shell. It also included a small little submarine build, one diver, and the turtle key. It was a pretty cool $30 special edition set, albeit a little odd of a choice to make a snapping turtle instead of an actual sea turtle. And along with some poly bags that I don't really think are worth mentioning because they're small and kind of pointless, that concludes the first wave of Atlantis. Lego really pumped a lot into that initial wave of Atlantis, and they made an accompanying wave that came out in the summer of 2010. The small wave in the summer is small, but it has some big sets and actually packed a lot of punch with some really cool stuff. The first set was a $20 set known as the Deep Sea Striker. Now, throughout this video, I've been mentioning the piece counts for these sets and a lot of Atlantis sets in the first year especially had really bad price for pieces especially for an unlicensed Lego theme however that is not the case with this deep sea striker set this is a yet again another giant oversized creature this one being a lobster which is kind of weird because there's no lobster warriors or lobster keys but you do have this giant lobster build it was $20 with 260 pieces. What a fantastic price for piece. And this thing was big. It was a big, big build. And the giant lobster had a pretty cool striking play feature. It actually had gears at the back of its tail. And the cool thing is you could twist those gears and it would make the back tail kind of, you know, sting like a scorpion or a lobster. Really cool play feature. I really liked this build. And now that I think about it, it's more of a giant underwater scorpion than it is a lobster, but that's just a whole other thing in of itself that's kind of an odd little detail about this particular set. It included one diver and yet again a small little underwater glider scooter build, and it also came with the Manta Key that we have seen in a number of sets so far throughout this Atlantis theme. Next up, for $50 from this wave, is my personal favorite Lego Atlantis set from the first year of Atlantis is the $50, 473-piece Atlantis Exploration Headquarters, aka Atlantis Exploration HQ. This set I reviewed on my channel was a big set, remember I saved up to buy it, and I was like blown away by the design of this set. It was a play set that was for the divers, of course. But the cool thing is, is this set sat on this like platform. You could lift off the platform, lift off the base, off the platform, and then fold it in, and it became a fully enclosed submarine build. Oh my goodness, this was such a cool play feature that blew my mind when I was like 12 or 13 when I originally got this set. That transformation play feature is one of the best play features I've ever seen in a LEGO set still to this day. It came with two divers and a Manta Warrior, which that Manta Warrior figure comes in so many sets, man. Like seriously, kind of a boring minifigure when you get it so many times because I actually think the Manta Warrior looks a little bit worse than some of the other sea creature warriors throughout these sets, but it also came with the turtle key. But this set, the figures don't really matter. The play feature is what matters. And that play feature was incredible. One of the greatest Lego play features I have ever seen. Speaking of sets with great play features, that brings us into the Portal of Atlantis, the set that'll be the thumbnail for this theme, the biggest Atlantis set ever made. The Portal of Atlantis retailed for $100, and it had a near-perfect price or piece with $1,007. Pieces. It's the biggest Lego Atlantis set ever made, and if you missed out on collecting all the keys from the rest of this theme, but you got this set, well, you were in luck because all five keys were included with this set, and they each had their own respective keyhole that you could put them in. And when you put all five of the keys, I was kind of building up to the play feature reveal of this set, all five of the keys opened up the portal to Atlantis, which was used by making with this really cool assortment of translucent blue pieces. You could twist them and the portal would open. Obviously, it doesn't open up a real portal or anything, but it does a pretty cool simulation of what that looks like in Lego form. It was a great play feature. And speaking of things being great in this set, this is probably one of the best sets for minifigures from the Atlantis theme because it included an exclusive Portal King 
minifigure, which is super cool. It also came with three divers, which is fairly generous. You also get a shark and the aforementioned squid warrior that came with the gateway to the squid set, which I think are the two best of the undersea warriors from this themes. But one of the funniest and coolest minifigures in this set is you actually got a skeleton of an Aqua Raiders deep sea diver. Kind of morbid, kind of odd, but it's also super cool because it's an Easter egg. It's a very morbid and dark Easter egg that implies that Aqua Raiders exists in this same world and that they tried to get to Atlantis, but unfortunately drowned there at the bottom of the ocean. But I just thought that was such a hilarious and fun inclusion on Lego's part. And I love when Lego kind of intertwines their different unlicensed themes. That's such a cool thing that Lego did with this set and i absolutely love that and you guys also seem to absolutely love this set because this set was voted on by you on my instagram page as your favorite and the best lego atlantis set ever made i would have to disagree the set that i think is the best atlantis set ever made we're going to talk about here in just a minute with the 2011 wave but i do see why some people would have some appeal in this set i think some people might you know sway being biased towards this set because this set is big and everyone likes the big flagship set of the wave that being said it is definitely a cool set has some great minifigures a great play feature and some awesome little easter eggs finally for the year 2010 we have the undersea explorer this is another store exclusive set that was $40. It had 364 pieces and it was a mech build, which is a little bit different for this wave. And it also had a very cool transformation play feature. This set on the legs have very noticeable wheels that are reused from like the Mars mission lines. And you could actually fold in the legs and turn this into an undersea buggy of sorts, which is actually pretty cool. The figures in this set though, pretty lame because there's actually just one figure and that's a very generic diver. It also came with an oversized creature that's like a weird long fish, maybe an eel, brick set and Brickopedia just lists it as a fish. Not a super exciting build, definitely one of the worst, probably the worst besides that manta ray that we talked about earlier of these giant overseas sized creatures. Now, if you listen to episode six of Brickology where I talked about Lego Ninjago season one, I mentioned a little fun anecdote in that episode, a little story that I had about in eighth grade, I was a part of a Lego club. And just to kind of reiterate that point from that episode, in eighth grade, my homeroom teacher made a Lego club that of course, I helped found and was a part of. And some of the original sets he bought for us to build in Lego Club were the Ninja Ninjago Dojo, but he also bought this set, which is a set that I never actually owned myself. So it's kind of cool for me to be able to get to build this set in the Lego Club. It was a cool set with a very cool transformation play feature, but it's definitely not one of the best Atlantis sets, but it definitely gets some brownie points from me because of my nostalgia to it from that Lego Club. So that's it for Atlantis in its launching year of 2010, but Atlantis did last another wave. It had a third and final wave in January of 2011. And before we talk about any of these sets, we have to talk about a very odd color change for these sets. The cockpits that were green and the accent colors that were green have now been changed to yellow, which Yellow still looks good. Yellow and red, you know, goes very well together, but it doesn't look as good in my opinion. I think the green was a way more striking color scheme and yellow was a little bit more generic that we've seen from other things in the past. While the green was super bright and colorful and very striking, yellow was a little bit more mundane. It still looked good, but not as good but it didn't really affect the quality of the builds of the sets too much for five dollars we got the ocean speeder had 54 pieces a diver minifigure another one of these small little glider builds and some sunken treasure not much to say about that set for $10, we had the Seabed Strider that I think was actually a noticeable improvement from the $10 set in the first wave of LEGO Atlantis that we already talked about in this episode. This set had 105 pieces, great price for piece. It was a small little mech build that could transform into a small undersea glider. Kind of repetitive with a lot of these builds, but it still looked really cool. And it introduced us, it was the smallest set to introduce the new graded 
column of pieces, one of my favorite Lego pieces of all time. Now these column pieces have existed for a long time. They are the two by two circular brick piece. It existed for a long time. It's pretty much the same piece, but now it's graded. So it can be used as gears and such, but it's also graded to give it more texture, which looks super cool. And this piece has been used a lot by Lego since its inception and introduction in this set and this wave of Lego Atlantis. It also included a diver and a new hammerhead shark minifigure, which this figure has one of the creepiest Lego minifigure heads ever. The hammerhead shark piece went over a minifigure head and the head piece was actually just used to make the mouth of the shark. It was a transparent red piece with the shark teeth printed on it. It was a super creepy headpiece that looked really cool. And I mentioned earlier in this episode that instead of searching after the keys in this theme or this line for Atlantis, they are now searching after the golden armor for the king of Atlantis. And this set in particular came with a golden shield that was on a small pedestal with those graded column pieces. Really good small $10 set. For $20 from this line was literally a perfect price for a piece with 200 pieces was the Angler Attacker, one of the few Atlantis sets that I personally never got. It was a giant oversized angler fish. Surprise, surprise, not too complicated there. Kind of a weird build. The eyes were way too big. It wasn't a super aesthetically pleasing build. I think one of the worst giant oversized sea creatures from this Atlantis theme. It came with a diver and also included the golden helmet and some sunken treasure. Not a great set, one of the weaker ones from this theme. For $30, we had the Deep Sea Raider, which is a set that I actually got like a few years ago. I think I may pick this up in like 2016 or something off eBay. Really cool set, really good submarine build with a nice unique cockpit piece. It looked really good. It had two Bionicle style arms. One had a drill and one had a hand. It looked really cool. And it had a small drone that actually like came out the back of the submarine. And the small drone was literally like a mini model of the same vehicle, which was super cool. I love that, really fun little play feature. Unfortunately, it only came with one diver and a hammerhead shark minifigure, and it also included the golden chest armor piece for the King of Atlantis. And last but not least for the Lego Atlantis theme, the Deep Sea Divers has finally accomplished their mission. They have found the lost city of Atlantis. For $70 and 686 pieces, we had the city of Atlantis. And this set is gorgeous. Seriously, this is one of my all-time favorite LEGO sets, which obviously means it's my favorite set from the Atlantis theme. This was such a beautiful place set. It had that ancient Greek style, ancient Roman style of architecture. It looked super cool. It kind of looked like the Parthenon. It's such an amazing looking Build. It also included a small sub, a small little crab build, two diver minifigures, an angler warrior figure, which was a cool figure that had a nice headpiece that had those little teeth coming out. Really cool figure. An exclusive crab warrior minifigure that had like giant crab claw hands. That was another great minifigure, and it came with the king of Atlantis himself with all of his golden armor and he had an additional golden Spartan helmet piece being reused from the Collectible Minifigure Series 2 minifigure. This set was gorgeous. Such a great design, such a great set. I was kind of let down it didn't win the best Atlantis set voting because this is personally my favorite Atlantis set and I just don't see how anything can touch how good this set is, but to each their own. Also, this set came with an exclusive sixth key that I believe was purple. It had a very nice print on it as well that could open up to the lost city of Atlantis. This is such a win of a set. One of the best Lego sets ever made in my opinion. And of course, unfortunately, I was still pretty young and it got thrown into a box somewhere and it's been pretty much destroyed. I really wish I still had this set built because it's that dope. But unfortunately, I don't, which is very, very sad. But that concludes my look, my deep dive into the history of Lego Atlantis. Thank you guys so much for listening to this day's, today's episode of Brickology. And look, a few weeks ago, I had a friend of mine tell me to stop apologizing for things being kind of off on Brickology. And you know, I did that the first few episodes. I was like, please be patient. I stopped doing that, but I think I need to say that again this week because... 
This was kind of a disastrous recording for Brickology. Literally, my SD card and my microphone just like stopped working for some reason. I have no idea why. I can't figure out why that stopped working. So if the audio sounds terrible, it's because I'm literally recording with the built-in microphone on my phone. Hopefully, I can use some of my editing magic to make it sound pretty good. But if the audio doesn't sound up to par with my other episodes of Brickology, that is why. And for some reason... There's people mowing all around my apartment complex right now, even though I've timed it so I normally record Brickology when that doesn't happen. For some reason today, of course, just today of all days, they decided to mow right now. So I'm sorry for all the background noise and crappy audio. This is definitely not the smoothest production of Brickology I have had, but we're at 10 episodes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for continuing to be along with me on this journey. If you have any questions for next week's episode, which will be the special Q&A episode of Brickology, email them to legolee329 at gmail.com. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. Consider following me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and maybe consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Any small donation, literally $1, will go a long way to helping me make the greatest content possible. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'll see you guys next time. Peace out. Bye-bye.